Sorry, I just started the recording, so the book launch will be recorded. Okay. Uh, Can I hold? Yes. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Sher, and I will be your host today. This event is the book launch of Brain Fever by Richard Muxton, brought to you by World Scientific Publishing. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules. All right, okay. Continue. So, a few housekeeping rules before we start. Please have your camera off and mics muted for the duration of the presentation. Uh, there will be uh, a quiz and a Q&A ses session after the talk. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat box if you have any, and uh, those will be read out and Richard can answer them after his presentation. Also, please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted online after. And uh, today we are joined by the author Richard Muxton, Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Oxford, as well as founder and first director of the Oxford Vaccine Group. Uh, furthermore, in attendance is uh, Winnie Smith from the uh, Meningitis Research Foundation and Steve Damon from Meningitis Now. Thank you very much for being here. And now I would like to hand this over to Richard, uh, who will tell us all about his new book. First of all, uh thank you all for uh, joining this uh, book launch on a, in the midst of a summer, and it's been uh, an incredible few uh, months. Anyway, I'm absolutely delighted to have a chance to be able to talk about my book. Um, you know, no intervention in the history of medicine has conferred a greater benefit to public health than vaccines. And as we are learning uh, from the pandemic, it's vaccines that we rely on to defeat uh, deadly diseases. Um, so brain fever, uh, what is uh, brain fever? Well, in Victorian literature, brain fever had a very special meaning in the novels of Conan Doyle, uh, Emily Bronte, uh, uh, Flaubert. It was essentially a, a mental breakdown or an illness following traumatic experiences. As for example, when uh, Rodolfo uh, rejects um, Madame Bovary uh, in Conan Doyle's The um, Crooked Man, uh, the very guilty wife uh, has brain fever when she realizes her husband's been murdered. Uh, and in Wuthering Heights, when Heathcliff returns, uh, uh, Catherine uh, Linton uh, develops brain fever. But for the medical profession, and this is a painting from 1891, rather a haunting one, for the medical profession, it meant inflammation of the brain, what we would now call meningitis. And here, Richard, can, Richard, can you put yes. these? Uh, it's onto full screen. The, the slides aren't moving on. Ah. So. Um, uh, Dad, the slides show button. that. Underneath yeah, the slides show that you clicked earlier. I'm having difficulty finding it. It should be on full screen. <laughs> Is that better? Uh, no, yeah. because we can see your notes now. Uh -oh. We don't want that. Uh, got it now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Are we okay now? Uh, no. It's still not full screen. I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. All right, good. Um, and um, so I will go back to, to describe this slide. So I was saying that brain fever to the medical profession, to doctors in the Victorian era, uh, had a very special meaning, brain inflammation, which we now know uh, as meningitis. 
And here in this haunting uh, oil painting, uh, we have the doctor looking at um, a child who might have been suffering from any one of the deadly diseases like scarlet fever, um, typhoid, um, diphtheria, and um, of course, meningitis. Um, now, let's bear in mind that at this time, there were no treatment for infections, certainly no antibiotics, and certainly uh, no vaccines. Uh, so um, this was, in fact, you may be surprised to know, at a time, 1891, when the idea that germs cause specific diseases uh, was not widely accepted. So um, this uh, gives you some idea as to why the uh, doctor here is looking so pensive and so hopeless. And in the background, you can see the stoic father and the mother collapse from exhaustion. Let's uh, fast forward um, almost a century. And uh, as a medical student, um, a trainee in pediatrics and eventually a professor in uh, pediatric infectious diseases. The disease that I encountered that I feared most and that was most devastating was meningitis and was the reason why in the 70s I decided um, to devote my time as a clinician scientist to doing research on understanding meningitis better and even uh, finding ways to prevent it. Uh, you'll notice all the code violations that health and safety might have thrown at me uh, in this picture in the 1970s. <laughs> well, um, what are germs um, that cause uh, infections? And uh, here you can see uh, that they're very small. I'll explain the size in a moment, but there are many different kinds of germs, all of which can cause meningitis. Although the most serious forms of meningitis are caused by bacteria, these are very small, one micrometer. So that means that um, uh, actually um, you could line up hundreds of these within the full stop uh, on one of the pages of my book. Um, so it's much, much less than the width of a hair. Incidentally, um, it is complicated because there are many different kinds of germs. You'll find that the media um, constantly muddle up bacteria um, and viruses, for example, which is extraordinary. So um, uh, if you take the time and trouble to read my book, at least you'll be in a much better position than some of the journalists. So it's bacteria um, that are the cause of the most serious forms of meningitis. So what is meningitis? Well, meningitis happens. You're going to need my to read my book, of course, to uh, really um, get to the bottom of this. But um, briefly, uh, meningitis happens when bacteria that are found harmlessly living in our nose and throats invade and spread to the bloodstream where they multiply. And the reason why they can multiply is something I'll, I'll deal with in a moment because they have special, the meningitis bacteria have special properties, but they spread to the brain or to be more precise uh, to the meninges, the linings of the brain. Um, and enclosed within the linings of the brain is a watery substance called cerebrospinal fluid, which acts as a protective layer. And this is where the bacteria multiply particularly um, efficiently um, in, in meningitis. So meningitis mostly affects young children, but anybody can get meningitis and, and they do. Um, and there are hundreds of thousands of cases each year tens of thousands of deaths. And still, even with intensive care and antibiotics, um, about 5% die. And of course, in parts of the world that are socioeconomically deprived, uh, where there's no access often to healthcare and certainly 
and no access to antibiotics, mortality is much higher. But even those who recover, 10% um, have lasting injuries, such as loss of vision, hearing, paralysis, epilepsy, impaired mental function. This is a very, very dreadful disease. And there's even one form of um, bacterial meningitis, which is very well known, in which you get a rash due to leakage of blood into the skin with terrible damage that can lead to something that may need grafting or even loss of limbs. And the impact of meningitis on the brain, I've told you that this is a disease that very particularly affects young children. So take a look at this diagram, which shows essentially the developmental stages from the newborn right through to a toddler. So we're going from uh, an individual that uh, is totally dependent, um, sleeping and feeding through obviously sitting up, walking, talking, uh, and uh, eventually the enchanting, but sometimes challenging, uh, terrible twos. Uh, 24 months. And you can see the enormous development and complexity of the brain during the very period when meningitis uh, is most common. You know, that's pretty grim stuff. And in a year that we've uh, been uh, all put to the uh, task, um, that's the bad news. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, hopefully, uh, therefore, what follows now uh, will be uh, a little bit more, uh, less grim and more, and, and more exciting for you. Because the good news is that vaccines have been developed that can completely prevent bacterial meningitis. So what is a vaccine? Well, um, the idea goes back a long time. Um, two and a half centuries, two, two and a half thousand years rather. And uh, it's uh, essentially recorded in the uh, literature of uh, Thucydides, um, the plague of Athens in 430 uh, before the birth of Christ. Interestingly, this plague is now thought by scientists to have been caused by Ebola. But the point is um, that uh, people realized that when you got an infection you and, and recovered from it, you could tend to the sick um, without essentially getting reinfected again. And this is what we call immunity. Um, and it's the principle which uh, in 1757, uh, I think everybody knows um, uh, that Edward Jenner um, used a weakened form uh, of the uh, smallpox uh, virus. Actually, it was a cowpox, a, a closely related uh, virus, as the basis uh, of um, a century, uh, something that had been going on for centuries, which was variolation. But what marked Jenner out was that he wrote it all down. He documented um, the um, uh, vaccination or immunization. Um, and sent it uh, as a recorded manuscript to the Royal Society. And this is why he is so famous and marks the bridge between uh, what one might call empiricism in vaccines to uh, the science of, of vaccines. Well, it was another century uh, uh, before we have germ theory and people realized um, that there were germs that could be are isolated and that were the cause of many, many diseases, including uh, meningitis. So let's learn a little bit uh, about making a vaccine against a bacterium that causes meningitis. So here we have um, an electron micrograph of, of a bacterium. What I hope you can see is that surrounding it, densely black, uh, is a covering, a shield or actually we call it a capsule. And it's made of sugary substances, um, not the sugar that you um, are used to putting into your tea or found on donuts or uh, uh, table sugar, but 
chemical substances that are very closely related to it, and they're called polysaccharides. Poly meaning many, um, saccharide uh, sugars. And, and this is really key because uh, this polysaccharide coating or capsule is both a friend and an enemy. It's an enemy because I've told you before that the bacteria that get into the blood are able to multiply. And the reason they do that is that they can are protected from being removed by our body's defenses by this sugary coating, by this polysaccharide capsule. But it's also the Achilles heel of the bacterium because we can take this polysaccharide, extract it from the bacteria, purify it, and use it um, as a vaccine. Um, but it turns out, like everything in science, it gets a little bit more complicated than this uh, rather nice uh, idea. So the idea is that when the polysaccharide is injected into our bodies, we have cells called lymphocytes. These are found in our bone marrow. They can be found in our blood. And they make antibodies. These are proteins. And these proteins bind to the surface of the bacterium. They bind to that sugar coating, that polysaccharide capsule. And they stop the bacterium from multiplying. And indeed, in the end, remove the bacteria and even kill it with the help of other immune defenses. So the idea of using the capsule polysaccharide as a vaccine is all very nice, neat and nice, but it turns out again to be more complicated. It's more complicated because there are different kinds of meningitis and different kinds of meningitis have different capsular polysaccharides. So we may need several vaccines to be able to prevent um, uh, the different forms of meningitis. But the other snag is that polysaccharides are not very effective vaccines, particularly in young children. And so you have to have a trick to make them essentially effective vaccines. And that trick, which took many, many years to develop and was actually quite complicated, even though the principle is very simple, you attach proteins chemically uh, to the polysaccharide. And this completely changes the polysaccharide in terms of its ability to produce effective immune responses and act as a very, very effective vaccine. But actually how much protein you put in, how it's linked to the polysaccharide and many other variables took years to work out. And also, of course, to ensure that these vaccines were safe. But they produced, they were a game changer. They were a game changer against most of the really serious forms of bacterial meningitis, producing very safe and highly effective vaccines. But again, science never turns out to be that simple. And there's one particular um, bacterium that causes a form of meningitis that is very common. It's called MenB. And the polysaccharide vaccines were absolutely useless in preventing MenB. They simply just did not work. And so a completely different approach uh, was needed. Well, that approach came about when in the mid 1990s, um, there was a revolution in science, which was the availability of complete genome sequences of bacteria. I'm sure everybody's heard of the Human Genome Project. What people may not be so familiar with is what an enormous impact DNA sequencing of bacteria had on infectious diseases. And in this particular example, um, it provided a possible way to be able to develop a, a vaccine against the elusive MenB bacterium. You can think of the complete genome sequence, which I'm showing on the left there in a rather complicated diagram, as a sort of yellow pages 
an inventory because every gene has been sequenced. And so every component that could be made into a vaccine is present in the genome sequence. You just have to be able to find uh, the right uh, gene products to do that. So would that approach, which in principle sounds so uh, excellent, would it work? Well, um, I have to say that um, it, it took a, a huge amount of time uh, to be able to realize um, the concept and put it into practice and make a vaccine. My own group in, in Oxford, a wonderful group of, of scientists, um, uh, got together uh, with um, a group led by Craig Venter on the left uh, there, who was one of the uh, initiators of genome sequencing. Um, and he had a team that did the DNA sequencing of the MEMB uh, genome. In the center there, um, Reno Rapoli and Maria Grazia Pizza led a, a huge team of scientists um, in uh, Chiron uh, Pharmaceutical Company um, based in Siena, um, now actually taken over and owned by uh, GlaxoSmithKline. But this was the, uh, in Siena, the um, uh, Chiron uh, 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 vaccine uh, facility for developing vaccines and manufacturing them. This was the engine room uh, of uh, making uh, the MenB vaccine and huge credit to Reno and Maria Grazia. And uh, luckily for me, I spent a lot of time um, uh, in their facility. Um, and as you can see, uh, Siena is a beautiful medieval city, um, an aerial view on the right uh, upper photo there. Um, in the center, you can just see the Piazza uh, del Campo, which is where the um, Palio horse race happens twice a year. And an interesting legacy to infectious diseases is at the bottom is the Duomo Cathedral. Um, what you can see there is that it's unfinished. To this day, it's unfinished. Why? Uh, because the plague that struck in the 14th century killed 70% of the inhabitants uh, of Siena at the very time when the cathedral was being built. So back to the project, and indeed, um, over many years, the genome sequence did yield um, the components uh, of a vaccine uh, against uh, the men B. Um, one needs to understand the length of time it takes to achieve this kind of vaccine development. Remember the first bacterial genome sequence is 1995, and, and then um, it took uh, about eight years before the antigens were uh, selected for the MEMB vaccine. In 2006, uh, trials in children began. I'm proud to say that um, about half of all of the children who were enrolled in the MEMB trials were recruited and the studies were carried out in Oxford, uh, led by um, Sir Andrew Pollard, um, who is, I think, uh, with us um, uh, today, and uh, his colleague, Matthew Snape. Um, really incredible um, effort. Um, and uh, of course, everybody knows about the Oxford vaccine group now uh, after the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, but they carried out a huge amount of the work that led to the MenB vaccine being licensed, first of all in Europe and then later in the United States. And eventually the government agreed to implement uh, the vaccine in 2015 and Public Health uh, England um, by 220, which was the time it took to find out just how well the vaccine was working, showed a 75% reduction in MEMB uh, meningitis. A safe, um, effective, if not highly effective vaccine, uh, a, a real uh, a, a, a triumph uh, of uh, technology. Well, 
Um, that sort of brings me to a very, very brief uh, race through some of the highlights of the book. Um, I hope that this will be a book not just for health professionals, but for all who are curious about the importance of and what it takes to develop uh, a vaccine. Uh, and it covers a lot of things from the history of germs and vaccines, the enormous role of public health, the impact of epidemics and pandemics, anecdotes about scientists, and I was sort of an insider within the story, the importance of pharmaceutical companies and all of the ethics, economics, and politics that go into uh, making a vaccine. I want to acknowledge the enormous support that I have received, not just from uh, the people who provide research funding, but from the fantastic colleagues that I've had over the years. And also my family and friends who have supported me through uh, what is a pretty busy and onerous uh, career. And finally, the team at World Scientific Publishing for producing uh, the book and organizing this launch. So where are we now? Well, we have a number of safe and effective vaccines against the major forms of meningitis. Um, and I've told you a little bit about that. But their implementation in many countries still requires a huge amount of work to be able to uh, essentially bring vaccines to those who need them most. So much more needs to be done. And I'm very, very pleased that we have um, with us today, and I'll leave it to uh, Emma Shea to sort of do the handover, but we have um, um, uh, two representatives of the meningitis uh, charities, the UK meningitis charities, which are uh, Meningitis Now and the Meningitis Research Foundation. Um, and I think they're going to have a chance to say a little bit about uh, the book, but most importantly too, uh, about where we go from here. Thank you, Emma Shea. So uh, as Richard mentioned, we have here with us today, Steve Damon from Meningitis Now and Winnie Smith from the Meningitis Research Foundation. If you could please say a few words about brain fever and uh, your mission and why it's important. Where do we go from here? Well. All I can say is, and some, most of you will remember, is that we are a long way from Stroud and Stonehouse back in the 1980s. And uh, those were the days when, you know, I first met you, Richard, and uh, our little group of families that uh, had experienced meningitis. I lost my son, Spencer, in 1982. Uh, we came up to the John Radcliffe and uh, spoke to you and uh, asked you to help us because... Uh, we didn't know a thing about how to go about raising awareness, uh, talking to the press. Uh, we were quite good at raising funds. And uh, you, you gave us a lot of support in those days and, and led the way, really. And uh, that was the beginnings of the meningitis movement, where we now have two really superb charities, patient groups, the Meningitis Research Foundation, Meningitis Now. And um, I can remember saying to you, um, when do you think you could uh, develop a vaccine? And uh, you said, well, Steve, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, it will be, uh, you know, a collaboration of scientists around the world that uh, will get together and hopefully, you know, in the years to come, it won't be now for some time, we will be able to develop vaccines. And uh, I looked a bit blank and you said, well, Steve, it's a bit like this. Uh, you imagine a big oak tree, and if you had a, a small axe, you would have to keep chipping away and chipping away, and then eventually mm. that oak tree would crash down. And every time there's been a breakthrough, you know, we had the hip vaccine in 1992 and uh, the MEMB in 2015. I've always thought of that oak tree, and I've spoken to many of our families and supporters since then and uh, explained how all these things were to develop a vaccine, which your, your book illustrates superbly. And, um, you know, it reminded me, it kicked, kick-started my 
my memory really with the, um, the the old TV adverts back in the early nineties. Um, it was um, the little toddler with the doll locking it in a coffin, and it was to encourage uh, families to um, parents to take up the vaccine for their loved ones. So, for me, you know, your support, your friendship, has been really fantastic and the book it's an insp inspirational book and um, it's a must read for any aspiring scientist really and everyone because um, it goes right back and it explains everything and um, I'd like to thank you also for uh, donating the royalties to Meningitis Research Foundation and Meningitis Now because uh, as you know uh, every penny counts these days and uh, we just couldn't do the work without the support of of everyone and uh, it's always been a team effort with uh, families who are the driving force behind the charity's activities but we couldn't do anything without the scientists and the press and publishers so um, it really is appreciated so on behalf of the meningitis movement we are internally grateful for everything you've done so thank you very much indeed thank you steve Thank you, Steve. I think I'll, I'll I'll try and follow that, Steve. But um, I think you've said some of the things so beautifully. I won't I won't repeat them. But um, I'd start with a thank you. I'm obviously extremely grateful to Richard for having written the book, and also to many of the people who have joined the call today, who've been also instrumental in that journey that Richard's described. And I think um, I just wanted to highlight really three reasons why I think this book is so important right now. Um, the first of which is to go to Steve's point he's just made, that Richard very eloquently highlights that at the heart of the whole thing are people and families. So Richard recounts in the book dealing with uh, very, very ill children and reminding us that that's what dri has driven his work throughout. And I think that that's something that uh, can be lost sometimes in very highly technical fields, but Richard really brings that alive in the book. And I think it's something that's just really important to hold on to, um, that that's what drives all the work. Uh, the second thing I would like to highlight is that the focus on, on technology and technology innovation suffuses all the way through the book and is as relevant today as it has always been. That's for vaccines, but it's also for assistive technologies that help people uh, who uh, live with disabilities. But increasingly today, it's also to do with information about the spread of news around the world, about the use of Facebook and social media to be able to spread messages. So technologies are, are at the forefront of this throughout. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight the perfect timing of the book, um, having being sandwiched between a World Health Assembly resolution in November last year, setting out a global roadmap to defeat meningitis by 2030, and the launch, the public launch of that initiative uh, coming up in September this year. So wonderful timing, Richard, um, spot on. And um, I think I just wanted to say a few words about why that's so important, because um, if you beautifully described 40 years of development, I think you've teed us up perfectly for the next decade of progress. And the, that progress could look like the defeat of meningitis. We very much hope it will. That could mean the end of epidemics, greatly reduced cases and deaths, and hopefully reduced disabilities and better support and information for people and families. And those three things together are what we mean by defeating meningitis. So you have teed up that next decade perfectly with both the book and your incredible work and contribution to the field. So it's a huge thank you. Um, and I would also highlight that the book is wonderfully expressive about the importance of collaboration. And the global roadmap itself has embodied that, involving uh, hundreds of people across many countries and many organisations and many institutions. And so, um, as Steve said, that's a collaboration between the charities and the professionals and the scientists and the public health officials. And so we need to carry that work on. Uh, and lastly, I just wanted to say, um, uh, if you're watching this for the first time or relatively new to it, or if you're not, you have the opportunity to buy this book and help defeat meningitis. That's what the money will help do. 
So we're very, very grateful for Richard donating his royalties to the Charities to Meningitis Now and Meningitis Research Foundation, because I know we'll put that to good use in the decade ahead, helping to defeat meningitis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny, for those kind words. I just want to say to those uh, who are listening, um, Vinny is being very modest about defeating meningitis 2030. This initiative, which has been endorsed by WHO, and she says it will be a big uh, um, <clears throat> a day in, in September of this year, this was pushed through, initiated and pushed through by Vinny himself. And I think you deserve a huge uh, congratulation for uh, putting uh, that roadmap in place. Thank you, Vinny. Thanks, Richard. Like, as you would say, there were many others involved, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Vinny and Steve, for the kind words. And uh, now we actually have a little game for all of you lovely participants who are giving up their precious time to be here with us. Uh, so we have a poll and uh, if you answer the question correctly, which Richard prepared, um, you have the chance to win a copy of Brain Fever. So I'm launching the poll now. You should see it on the screen. And please uh, answer which of the following statements is or are correct. It's a multiple choice. So the first one is the germ theory of disease dates to around the 17th century coinciding with the invention of the microscope, or meningitis literally means infection of brain cells. The third one is that the first effective conjugate vaccine to protect against meningitis was, appro was approved in uh, 1987. And the last is that proteins are essential components of all currently approved bacterial meningitis vaccines. We will leave a bit of time for you to think. Um, we have two copies to give away and we will notify the winners in email after the event. Uh, while the answers are trickling in, I would like to call to your attention that we have a chat box. And if you have any questions to Richard about brain fever, about vaccines, about any of the things that he uh, talked to us about, then feel free to leave your questions in the chat box and I will be reading them out uh, after the polling ends. So just uh, 30 minutes now, and then I will be closing the poll, and we will move on to the Q&A. Okay, I will end the polling now. Uh, Thank you all for uh, voting. I can share the results. And uh, Richard, could you share with us what the correct answer? Yes, there's only one correct answer and it's the third or C, 
the first effective conjugate vaccines to protect, protect were in 1987. Thank you so much. So all of you who voted that, you stand a chance of winning a copy of Brain Fever. Uh, we will let you know very shortly after the event ends who is the lucky uh, winner. Thank you. Uh, so now onto the Q&A, we had some questions arrive while, while the polling was going on. So we have one asking, uh, Richard, are you surprised by the 75% reduction? Would you have anticipated better or less good? Can you repeat Can the you question? I'm sorry. Sure. So are you surprised by the 75% reduction? Would you have anticipated better or worse? Yeah, it, it's a very good question because I think um, uh, it was a complex vaccine um, and uh, we knew all the way along the development of it that the big problem was going to be um, uh, having a vaccine that would be broadly uh, protective against all the different uh, strains of men B. It's an extremely variable uh, bacterium. So actually, I think the um, reduction, um, and of course that translates into um, other ways of measuring the effectiveness of the vaccine, is actually round about exactly what I would have predicted um, based on, um, you know, in a sense, the theoretical uh, knowledge of the vaccine and what it could do. So I think it, it, it's a fair, um, uh, uh, figure um, that, um, as I say, it's highly effective, um, but uh, certainly very far from being uh, the complete answer to the men B problem. Uh, we have another from Winnie. Uh, Richard, what would be your highest priority for meningitis vaccine progress in the next decade to come? Well, the biggest issue, obviously, I've mentioned already, um, is to be able to get these highly effective vaccines uh, so that they are implemented uh, globally. Um, we have, for example, huge uh, numbers of people in China, in Thailand, to, uh, who, who are not uh, receiving one of the really major uh, meningitis vaccines here. So um, that's what, of course, the um, uh, Defeating Meningitis 2030 is all about, is to, is to try to um, essentially enlarge the scope uh, of the impact of the vaccine uh, globally. Um, I think that uh, the other area that um, we were certainly um, hope to see some progress um, is uh, that there are forms of meningitis that are particularly um, severe in the newborn, which are different kinds of bacteria from the ones that I've discussed um, and for which we have vaccines currently. Um, and that's a huge challenge because um, newborn or neonatal meningitis means that you have to protect the infant uh, by making sure that the mother is protected and can pass on protection to her unborn child so that when they are born, uh, they're able to resist essentially infection. So that will be a very big challenge and there is good progress uh, on um, a form of meningitis called group B streptococcal meningitis, which is a very serious and very big problem. In the history of vaccines, what would you say was the biggest technological change or advancement? Biggest technological change? Well, I think that what we have seen um, through um, various kinds of technology is that um, the safety of vaccines has been enormously improved um, over the uh, last decades. Um, going back obviously um, to the earlier um, vaccines, many of them were crude um, and 
and therefore had, in addition to their ability to protect, uh, they had also side effects. And I think that one of the things that people are most concerned about uh, with vaccines is that they are safe. And the technology that has been applied to producing vaccines that are extremely safe uh, has been absolutely huge because as we know, we're in an era uh, when vaccine hesitancy, even um, antagonism to vaccines um, is proving to be a really, really tough problem. And you are certainly going to have big problems if you do not have very, very safe uh, vaccines. So that's been a huge, huge uh, change in the um, uh, uh, availability of, of safe vaccines. Uh, we have a comment coming in saying that, Richard, you have been an inspiration to so many of us. What is your next book going to be about? <laughs> Uh, I think my experience of writing one book is going to me <laughs> leave me uh, definitely uh, pausing before I embark on another. And I think there's some of my family, immediate family, uh, listening in and they'll say, no, dad, no, granddad, <laughs> not another one, please. It's a lot of work. Um... Another one is saying, as we won't likely have better antibiotics and maybe also not better vaccines, do you think the turning point in defeating meningitis would be some form of host-directed treatment? No, I don't think so. I mean, prevention really is the way to go. Um, many forms of bacterial meningitis and other forms of meningitis um, happen so rapidly. Um, they happen in a matter of hours or certainly a few days um, from the time of exposure. And once uh, meningitis is established, and it is an inflammation of the brain, um, even if you come in um, with uh, antibiotics or um, uh, immunotherapy, which is, I think, what the question is directed towards, the problem is the damage has already been done. Um, and okay, you can certainly lessen um, the impact, ameliorate the disease, but actually this is one of the best examples of where it's absolutely vital to prevent the disease from ever happening. I hope that answers the question. I believe it does, thank you. Um, do you think the uh, mRNA technology that has been so important for fighting COVID might have a role for future generation uh, meningitis vaccines? Well, um, you know, it's opened up um, a, a completely new um, and previously untested uh, area of vaccines um, in that um, what has been done with the COVID vaccines, and I know that there are many different kinds uh, of vaccines, but the advances that are most striking to me uh, are that they're based on um, using um, new technology to be able to present either the DNA, the gene, if you will, of the spike protein, or the uh, nucleic acid information called messenger RNA um, that is used to make the protein, the spike protein. Now, before the pandemic, um, we really had no idea, and I don't think people probably understand this, we had no idea whether or not these vaccines would work. The fact that they have is absolutely fantastic. And that uh, mRNA, the messenger RNA vaccines uh, are working, uh, offers an incredible platform for future uh, vaccines because what it's done is provided a proof of practice, not just a proof of concept, that you can take this messenger RNA, package it in an appropriate way uh, and prevent a deadly viral infection. And we did not know, we literally did not know that this was going to work before 
essentially um, this pandemic. So that's been a really, really, I mean, vaccines, as I said before, it's taught us um, once again <laughs> that our fight against uh, deadly pathogens um, needs uh, vaccines. We, we rely on them. Without the vaccines, the whole global, the, the whole pandemic would be a totally different story. I don't know whether Andy Pollard, whom I think um, not only played a huge role uh, in one of those vaccines, wants to comment. Well, if he does, he's welcome to chime in. <laughs> uh, Richard, yes, I, I completely agree. I mean, what, what, what we um, have been very fortunate here is having a wide variety of different technologies during the pandemic that could be applied to the problem. And I think that given that there's actually been so many failures of vaccines here, it's the right approach. And I think one thing we need to bear in mind for the future is not to put all our eggs in one basket. We know we've got a couple of new technologies that have gone well, but we could easily be in a position in the future where the, the only approach we could have might be for an inactivated vaccine, for example, that some of the oldest forms of a vaccine, because we just don't know the antigen, we don't know the, uh, the best approach facing the sort of threat we had a year ago. The difference this time around was that we actually knew, know a lot about coronaviruses and we knew how to make vaccines. So we were in a very good position. I'm not sure that's gonna be the case next time. So uh, the, all of the new technologies that we've been working with and others are very exciting, but I don't think we should throw the old things out uh, because we might need them next time. Thank you so much for chiming in. Uh, we have another question regarding future technologies. Uh, do you think that uh, neonatal bacterial meningitis will yield to vaccine or perhaps to several vaccines someday? Yes, I, I think that it's been a really, really tough um, uh, 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 vaccine to, to make for the, the reason that I said, you, you, you know, to protect a newborn, they've got to essentially um, have the immunity at the time, obviously, that they're born, and that means um, what's called maternal or uh, mother immunization. And, and that is obviously an area of vaccinology um, that um, is, is really important, um, uh, and um, the, the, the possibilities for one form of bacterial meningitis is well on the way, the group B uh, streptococcal neonatal meningitis. So it's been a long, long journey, but these are long journeys. Vaccines do not happen um, uh, uh, usually in, in, in a short period of time. And that's what's so remarkable, of course, about the COVID vaccines is that they were done in less than a year, but everything had to go right. And I mean, uh, not taking anything away from the huge uh, successes of the scientists, there's no way that they could have known that it was going to be that successful. So um, generally speaking, vaccines take a long time to get to uh, the point where they can be uh, given safely and effectively. Richard, this is Ken McIntosh. I was the one oh, who asked Ken, that question. Lovely to hear you. And I asked it before you were talking about the group B, but I was wondering also about the uh, E. coli and other gram negative, whether you see that them as, as subject to vaccines in the future. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough one, uh, Ken. Uh, the the um, <clears throat> E. coli in particular ought to um, be one of the vaccines that would be um, approachable, but as you know, um, the polysaccharide of the major cause of E. coli neonatal meningitis uh, is a problem, not only because like the men B, it doesn't induce immune response, but one's got all of the safety um, issues associated with it because unfortunately the men B polysaccharide is a mimic uh, of um, a molecule that's on um, brain cells and many other cells. So uh, I think that's um, a long ways off at the present time. Um, 
The alternatives to polysaccharides, which is the main way to be able to prevent um, bacterial meningitis, whether it's neonatal or the later forms, um, when it comes down to proteins, you enter into a much, much tougher uh, area of combat to get a vaccine. So it's not going to happen easily. Thank you. It's lovely to see you, Ken. <laughs> So much for the follow-up. And then uh, our last question of the day is, uh, are the priorities in wealthy countries likely to translate well to low-income countries? And how do we shift the focus? That's a huge question. Um, I don't feel remotely qualified to provide a good answer to that. Um, you know, the, the, the issue of the strategies uh, for being able to realize um, the potential of vaccines in public health terms, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's huge. Um, and it's just full of battles and complications and politics and finance and ethics. I, I really don't feel remotely qualified to make a comment that can fit into 30 or 60 seconds, because we're almost uh, time expired and people are going to need to do other things. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to pass on that one. It's it's a tough one. Understandable. Uh, before everyone leaves, uh, I will ask Richard to stop sharing his screen so I can uh, share with everyone our uh, special discount code, which you can use in the World Scientific Web Shop to purchase brain fever, uh, should you wish to do so. Uh, I will also be sending these out via email, so if you don't catch it, not to worry. Uh, but I would like to uh, show it to you in any case, so you can go ahead and support the wonderful work of the charities uh, and read Richard's book, which is it's just the wrong slide. <laughs> so. Yes, so it's the code is brain fever 30. Uh, and the website is just worldscientific.com. Feel free to look for brain fever and enter the code at checkout, or you can scan uh, this QR code here for the more technologically savvy, and it will take you straight to the page of brain fever. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, thank you, uh, Vinny and Steve, for being here with us and uh, sharing your perspectives on the subject. And thank you, Richard, for writing this book and sharing your story and your insights into uh, meningitis and uh, immunology and vaccines today. Thank you, and thank you for setting up the launch, but particularly thanks to all of those who have joined in and participated in this um, launch. Really, really glad to see so many uh, familiar faces. And uh, I'd love to have a list of all the people who attended because I, I haven't got it immediately available to me, but I'm sure I, I can <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> if you learned one thing from today, it's that I am, am very poor on technology. Thank you all for being here once again. I will uh, stop sharing my screen now and I will end the meeting. Uh, but as I said, I will be uh, sending emails to all of you. And we just got a comment from Sally Hope saying, uh, thanks Richard, Tony and I loved your talk. Brilliant, so proud of you all. And uh, from uh, Andrew Pollard, congratulations. Uh, and I'm sure everyone's sharing those sentiments. So thank you once again. Uh, the recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel. I will be sending all of those who participated the link so you can rewatch it should you wish to. And I wish you all a very lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.